get a notification now. Okay, boom. Here we go. And we are live. I want to thank everyone for tuning in to a very special edition of Off the Record on the People's Podcast today. We have an amazing guest with us this afternoon, uh, Sister Captain Amy Muhammad, who uh, watched me and my siblings grow up and is a great trainer of women and just someone who's very nice and will put in a lot of work in our nation. I thank you for taking time out of your busy uh, schedule. Assalamu alaikum, ma'am. Can you hear me? Well, like, Mom, okay, I thank beautiful. you for all those kind words. You know it's hard to hear. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay, well, Sister Captain, the first thing we want to know is when did you first hear the teachings of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad? Oh, now that's a long time ago, you know. Uh, it was 1985, <laughs> Madison Square Garden. A lot of people will remember that. Excellent. And did you accept right away? Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. I was um, still in the reserves for the Marine Corps. I actually went to Madison Square Garden with my mother. And don't ask me how I, I, I don't remember hearing anything about Minister Farrakhan before then, but I knew I had family members that had been in the nation during the first rise. Um, mm. So I went with my mom and we were part of that group that they told us the guard, the, the arena was sold out. We were right at the front doors when they told us they were sold out and everybody go home. And the entire crowd pushed behind us um, and kind of smashed us up against the glass doors trying to get mm. in. Mm. Finally, the doors were opened mm. and we got in and found out it wasn't even half full. But that was my first time mm -hmm. hearing him. And uh, I have to say, honestly, I didn't come into the nation and I really believe it's because I left New York right after that. And I moved down to Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. There was no mm. presence of Islam, but something did um, awaken in me from hearing it. So I believe that this drive I was feeling was taking me to the church. So mm. I joined the church when I got down there and I, I became heavily involved and I was, you know, just knee deep in the church. And mm. I think that was what that spiritual awakening was, but it ended up directed towards the church because that's what I saw. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And when you were in the church, were you in the choir? Were you like a deacon ass? Like what, what was your role in the choir in the church? I was definitely not in the choir. Anybody who knows me knows I'm not gonna be singing, but I was one of those young women that was being taken and groomed by the deaconess, believe it or not. I was mm -hmm. one of those ones sitting on the first first pew in the church with all of those older deaconess and um, honestly that you know it, it's a short story but I can I can make it short as I came up in the church being groomed by these women I was the type that would bring my books and bring my bible and my notebook and I'd take notes while the minister was teaching and mm -hmm. it was that taking the notes that ended up getting me in trouble because mm -hmm. I started mm -hmm. noticing that he would quote things that the Bible didn't say. And he mm -hmm. would catch the spirit at the same moment every Sunday and things started to not add up. And so mm -hmm. over, the, over the years, and it was, it was only a matter of two or three years, it think, there was so much that I questioned that I started being kind of um, pushed to the side <laughs> by those same women that were grooming me because I was questioning the minister. And mm. it came to the point that the minister at, at one point, I'll never forget his name was Reverend Brown, told me that I was distracting him by taking notes while he was preaching. 
Mm, and mm. he asked me not to take notes and ask questions. Um, so when I left North Carolina and moved back up north, of course, I still had this hunger, but I was ripe again to hear the teachings, which takes me to the second time that I heard the minister, which was the Javits Center in 1993. Um, mm. And, and that, was, that was the point. I heard, I, I, I'll never forget that meeting. I sat in the Javits Center and I had a drive that I just had to be there. I had to be there. My best friend came along with me. She had no, no desire to see it, but she came because she, she was my best friend. And I filled out my acceptance card at that meeting in the Javits Center. Praise be to Allah, beautiful. And uh, how did your parents feel about you accepting the teachings? Um, I can remember my mom, I, my mom actually came in the nation after I did. It, it, it kind of stirred her and she came in the nation within a couple of years after I did. Okay, my okay. dad, I'll tell you, my dad was one of the Southern Baptists and he had no problem except for you're going to give up eating pork. And I was like, well, that wasn't that big, a, big an issue because I was already straddling the fence. Half my family was seven day Adventist and half were mm. Baptist. So literally... Mm -hmm. As a, as a child growing up, I learned to eat the good pork. I ate bacon and I ate ham, but I've mm. never eaten a pig's feet and mm. I've never eaten chitlin. So it was kind of like you had to find your way between those two worlds. Um, but I do remember mm. that one time my father said to me, you sure this is what you want to do? Because you know the way the nation of Islam works, your car, you have to give them your car. And if they tell you you want your children, you have to give them your children. And I said to him, <laughs> well, this is what feels right. So I guess that is what I want. <laughs> and um, mm -hmm. that was that was their only comment. After that, they were full, full steam behind me. Praise now, me keep in Allah. mind, when I came to the nation, I already had three children. So I brought my children along with me. And they had to make that transition at the same time that I was. So. Mm. Yes, ma'am. And when you came in, who who trained you? Like how? Like who was like? What, what were the laborers like in you were in Philly, right? I I came in in Philly. I accepted I accepted at the Javits Center, but I yes, came into the nation at number twelve. And let me just tell you, for my entire life, I'll never forget. It was Sister Captain Shirley, and Sister Captain Gale. Mm. Um, those two sisters were my newborn mothers, okay? They put the fire on you. They put the love in you. They put the discipline. Those two sisters, for me, were exactly what MGT was all about. They mm -hmm. were dedicated. They, they just instilled in me that, that never turn your back on the MGT, never. Beautiful, praise be to Allah. I, and, I don't and know if any, anyone remembers them, but you can't forget. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and this is Sister um, Shirley from Philly or Shirley from somewhere else? From Boston. Okay, I was making sure. I just want to make sure. Okay, yes, ma'am. Okay. No, because my moms, my moms would say stuff like Big Shirley and Little Shirley. And you know, it's all different things. That's right. Yeah, yeah, little so Shirley know. was the mom and Big Shirley was her daughter. They used to call her Shirley Jr. Okay, yes, ma'am. And then Sister Gail was the MGC Sister, captain in Philly. Sister Gail Muhammad, yes, indeed. She, okay, she, she, to this day, she is my heart. She could ask me for anything, and I mm -hmm. would move earth for her. I'm Praise just telling you. And those sisters in number 12, those sisters in number 12 had just really started to um, come into their own. They had, they were disciplined they they were moving to a period where they were discovering what sisterhood was and what mgt was when i say we were in the mosque every day we were in the mosque every day except for monday we were cooking selling they these sisters taught drill they taught prayer we had 
stabilization class, which at the time, most, most classes didn't have that. We had that. So we had orientation, stabilization, and MGT. And I'm telling you, it, it was a foundation that cannot be beat. Praise be to a lot. Now, can you clear the word stabilization for us? What does that mean? It was a period, it was a class in between orientation where you just learn the basics. Yes, ma'am. And kind of being thrown into the larger class of MGT. The stabilization mm -hmm. sisters were almost in a protective bubble. We came through orientation and then in stabilization, we were allowed to kind of get stronger in our MGT and the, and the larger class was told, you know, don't mess with them. Don't teach them your bad habits. You know, don't, don't jump on them if they mess up. We fell directly under Sister Captain Gale and it gave us a chance to get our roots deeper before we were put into the larger class with all the different personalities and different habits and, and things like that. So it was kind of a, a, a middle ground, so to speak. Praise be to a lot, beautiful. Well, speaking of your children and being trained, I met you through your children because of drill. When did you uh, find um, a passion for drill? Uh, truthfully, uh, in the Marine Corps. Yes, ma'am, <laughs> yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yes, ma well, I'm not gonna I'm not going to tell the story now. When I came in and I saw that they were drilling, I was like, this is on the money. See, that's military. Okay. That's military. Yes, yes, and I'm going to take you back one second, because when I first saw the minister in 1985 at Madison Square Garden, the very first thing I saw, keep in mind, I was in the Marine Corps. The first thing I saw was him surrounded by women. I did not know that was unusual. I thought, mm. this is it. I looked up and I remember seeing him on the stage and I said, see, now here's a group that knows the value of women and how strong we can be. That man has women doing his security. And I, 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 I that was it. That was it. Because I, I figured strong women, they respect us. They use us. I was here. So when I saw drill, the idea of trying to, I mean, we worked hours, hours and hours and hours of practice to finally move as one. When you hear that sound, that one step, one sound, there's nothing that beats it. It shows you that you really just one body with a lot of different moving parts. Praise be to Allah. And speaking of drill, when I first saw you drill, um, it was uh, uh, four of you all drilling and winning first place and um, TikTok and tops of the clock and all of this great stuff. Were you nervous to drill with just a small amount of people on the stage? Um, definitely. Um, yeah. Now, let me just tell you, when you saw that four drill, I wasn't in that group. Mm. That first four, that first four, was, were the ones who drilled when I came in. That was my mm -hmm. first year. But when you saw that first four on drill, that that was our core group of, of Vanguard. And that very next year is when I was in there, which of, of course that's when one times we were winning. Okay. Yes, <laughs> but yes, it was nerve wracking. It, it was nerve wracking, but let me tell you something. To be able to become together in a small group, truthfully, it's even harder sometimes than the large group because you can mm. get lost in it. You don't hear a stutter step when there's 20 of you on the, on the stage. Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. The 18 who are doing it right will drown out the one who's, who's missing a step. Yes, ma'am. When you have four or six like we had, every little sound, Everything, Sister Gail made us make sure that we each, no matter the fact that we were different heights, she made sure we each lifted our feet the same number of inches off mm. the floor. Mm. That mm. was all Sister Gail. She drove that. And she was mm. another military person. She retired mm. from the military. So she understood what it took to get people together. She understood that sometimes you got to drive them. 
but then yes, she was also always there to be that shoulder to lean on after. So Praise yes, it was it was nerve wracking. It was scary. <laughs> Beautiful. Both of my sisters send the greetings. Sister Nicole uh -huh. Salaba sends the greetings, and thank you all for seeing a lot of people's podcast. Yes, ma'am. And well, I wanted to ask you. I I definitely I you know I, I'm a mom, and I'm gonna tell you, your mom and 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 I think the same. The children, the young, the teens, the 20s, the 30s, whatever it is that comes up after us is our legacy. We don't live unless you all succeed. And so mm -hmm. we always ha have that, that kind of kind feeling for the, the younger ones coming up. And I, I admit, I, I kind of mother everybody, so. Yes, ma'am. And, and we thank you for that. Uh, I wanted to ask you, Oh, what was it like for you meeting the most unmissable spark account for the first time? Hmm. Um, you know what? It's kind of like when you think back, you can almost feel that same level of, of awe. I'm going to tell you the honest truth. I met him the first time. I, I, I won't say by accident, but it was unexpected. It wasn't come in this room and you're going to meet the minister. I was assigned as a server, which I did not know what that job was. I, I In my head, server, I thought, I don't know, like McDonald's, okay? But mm -hmm. I was assigned as a server and I, I was working in the suite and I was putting dishes in and I heard a voice and I'm standing there just unpacking boxes and I heard a voice and, and it said, I saw him like him, sister. And it kind of caught me. And I looked over and he realized that he had caught me by surprise because he was smiling. And mm -hmm. I looked over and I was thinking, do I, do I give him the greetings? And so I returned the greetings and he just smiled and he nodded and he walked on. And I had to stop for a minute because I, up until that point, even though I was there in the suite, it never dawned on me that that was the, the circle that I was going to be moving in. I just, mm. all, I, all I was about was the work. It was like they asked me to do it. I did it. I didn't really look for something like a blessing like that to come to me. And so it really did catch me by surprise. It really did. Praise be to Allah. That was... <laughs> That was the moment I'm never going to forget, never. And it's not about some kind of, um, you know, some kind of idol worship thing. It was, it was a feeling more than a knowledge. And I've, I've always gone by the, the feeling, the feeling that I get and the feeling I, I, that comes up in me when I hear the teachings, that's what that was. That was like, oh my gosh. And, and you can't you can't replace it. Praise be to Allah, beautiful. And what, um, man, that's beautiful. Okay. And my next question was, what was it like for you to be around the, uh, Mother Farrakhan? Oh, oh, she is so beautiful. Um, she feels like she makes you feel like she's your mom. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll tell you, uh, when, when we were there, and I'll remember sitting and, and just her being so relaxed, but yet regal. Can you imagine putting those two things together? She <laughs> moves and she would talk to you as though she has known you forever, but yet she always had that kind of regal demeanor that that made you just want to give her whatever it is you think that she wanted. Whatever it is, whether it was a cup of tea, what, whether it was do something for one of her children, she just made you to feel like she was your, your, your mom and you just wanted to, to, to be there for her, take whatever the load off of her. You saw in her what a sacrificing woman that is not that is not resentful of her sacrifice, that was mm. joyfully sacrificing. Beautiful. That, that and, 
Fans be so alive. And how did you become the captain? I had no idea. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, honestly, it goes back to that if you ask me and I can do it, I will do it. Doesn't matter what it is. I was asked if I would serve as the captain. Um, I came home. I, I talked to my husband about it because I, I had married by then. And I, I talked to him and it was like, now you understand this is going to be a lot. And he, he understood, you know, he's FOI. He, he, he knows what it was about. And he said, well, if you're going to do it, do it. And it was really just about serving. It was a need was there. If I can do something for the sisterhood and the brothers in the mosque, then I'm going to do it. There, there is nothing simpler than that. It was no grand design. I was the Vanguard captain at the time. It was just simply, it was something that needed to, to for the mosque. And there I was kind of that here am I, I will serve kind of thing. Yes, ma'am. Beautiful. And what, what was it like to have your children, your daughters drill and become successful? How was, how did that make you feel as a mom? Oh, it was wonderful. They drill better than I did. But let me <laughs> tell you about drill. Anyone who remembers me drilling knows one thing. I had to work hard because I don't exactly have an abundance of the rhythm gene. So it, if everybody got it on the third time, then it, Sister Amy was going to get it on the fifth time. But yes, she wasn't going to give up. She wasn't going to give up. She was going to keep trying. And to watch them be so good at something I wanted to be good at. Because mm -hmm. I, I worked hard to get it, but they seemed like it was more natural for them. And it was just, uh, it was another man, of the many blessings. There is no greater feeling for a mom or a, or a parent than to see your children being successful in something. That's what you what you are are just. That's what you work so hard for. Praise be to Allah. And now you were in Philadelphia, one of the you know murder capitals of the East Coast. It was crime was high. Did you did you did, was, there, was there ever time that you faced fear? And if so, how did you overcome that fear? Um, most definitely. You know, I grew up in New York, and they talk about mm. crime in New York. First off, when it comes to crime, I never experienced crime until I moved to Philadelphia. Mm. I was carjacked by four, four guys at gunpoint. I had to run in a stampede. I have stood on an intersection and watched someone shooting into a crowd. All of that happened in Philly. All of it happened mm. in Philly. Um, and I'll tell you this, most times for me, it's not a matter of facing your fear because the fear is just, it comes on you, it's natural. It's a matter of writing it out. Trying to do what you know you were supposed to do and just get through it and trust that when you get to the other side, you're going to be okay with it. Um, mm. I had a I had a greater fear of messing up or not doing well times when I was on post and knew people were depending on me than I ever had just worrying about myself. I, mm. My fear doesn't come from my personal well-being. My fears usually come of disappointing people or falling short and somebody that I'm doing security for, you know, gets hurt or something happens. Those are the, those are the fears that I would think of as bigger for me. And the only way I got through those was rely on my training, rely on the other people, because I'm, it's never just me and, yes, push, and push through. I do a whole lot of praying. But when I finish praying, I try and do a whole lot of moving because yes, yes, to just get on, there on, on the prayer rug or to stand in the corner and pray, 
and then not try and do what you're supposed to do, I don't, I don't know how that's going to come out. Praise be to Allah. What was it like as a uh, an MGT and a woman leading up to the Million Man March, and how did the Million Man March personally impact you as a sister? Um, um, look, you know what? The Million Man March impacted me in the idea of seeing so many of my brothers that people were writing off that you saw on the news all the time, that people talked about come together. When I, I sat during Millie Man March, one of um, my nearest and dearest sisters in Philadelphia, Sharon Muhammad, and I watched together. We fasted before, um, we fasted. That was the longest, matter of fact, that was the longest fast I've ever done, 17 days leading up to the Millie Man March. Mm -hmm. We fasted and we watched it on television together. And it was just a, a feeling of, how can I say it? Looking at, at, the, at those brothers out there, in your head, you were going, see, I knew the black man was God. They just did not give them a chance up until then. What mm -hmm. they did at the Million Man March showed the entire world, the entire world that Yes, there's a diamond inside there, and y'all have no clue. And that's how I felt. Praise be so loud. Beautiful. Um, Sister Khadija is commenting. Sister Ariane is sending her love as well. Boom, boom, boom. Oh, my baby. Yes, ma'am. Excellent. My next question for you is oh, what was your... Ma'am? I, I can hear you. Those are my your... babies, but then I remind myself they're all grown up. Oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. What um, has been your greatest trial and how have you overcome that trial? Um, I think my greatest trial is how hard I am on myself, mm. honestly, um, because everything else is a test. Marriage is a test. Raising children is a test. Going to work every day is a test. But a trial to me is something that continues to, to try to get in your way. And to me, for myself, I know I am, I have a hard time moving past and forgiving myself. So if you look back at 14 years old and I messed up on such and such, and it's still in your head. It, I don't know how people forget the things that mm -hmm. they've done because I seem like I remember every one of them and I have to remind myself that if Allah can forgive you, if Allah can look past you, then you really need to be doing the same. And I think that's my trial because I, I stay hard on myself and mm -hmm. um, everything else I can handle. It, it, you know, I may not want to handle it. I may not want to handle loss. I may not want to handle, you know, things happen to my loved ones, but I believe that I can handle it because I do know where to go to get strength. But the yes, one thing that I keep having to remind myself is to not be so hard on myself. Praise be so a lot. And what has been your greatest joy? Mm. Well, you know, this is going to sound really corny. My greatest joy is to see my children, to see, and keep in mind, I count you, your sisters, all the juniors that I've grown up with, and the moms, I count all of you as my children. And y'all know that's how I always act. Yes, but to see, to see them move ahead and move further than myself is my greatest joy. To see them successful, to see them go through their own trials and come out on the other side, to know that, that they've got that seed of faith and, and, and love, that is, is my greatest joy, honestly. And I know it sounds corny, but that is me. <laughs> I know it sounds corny, but if I have no success at all, my success is seeing myself through them moving forward. My children, my grandchildren, they're going to be here way after I am. And then their children are going to be here. And, and so 
that's how I can feel like I've contributed and I've done something. Thanks be to a lot. My sister Mimi says, that's beautiful. We love you and appreciate you and your family. Um, thank you all for your sacrifice. Okay, now um, I have just a few more questions for you, but I wanna make sure that I thank a quick 60 second break to thank all of the sponsors of the People's Podcast this uh, month. Please cash app the People's uh, Podcast for your sponsorship. One second. This is Kevin coming right back to you. Here we go. Right. Here we go. Okay, so now starting with, here we go. Here we go. Starting with Street Premiere Media Production. That's my brother Rashad and his business partner Jamal. They have a 4K camera and a drone. They're working on television and film and they're doing a great job at it as we speak. My sister Miriam has a children's book, ABC I Love Me, and coloring book, both of which are on Amazon. Please make sure you go get that. My sister Naima, uh, Stay On Point Dance Academy. She teaches ballet to young women across the country, as well as in the studio here in Atlanta. Um, Supreme Men's and Boys Urban Wear in St. Louis. Thank you very much for your sponsorship. If you want to get dressed and be dripping well, reach out to our brother. Raising Black Millionaire, Sister Tia Muhammad. She has flashcards to teach young uh, Black children economic empowerment and development. Uh, Brother Kenneth Muhammad, bow tie maker extraordinaire. He'll ship the bow ties to you all across the country. I'm coming right back to you, Sister Captain. Exodus, a new way of life, credit restoration. You do a great job at making your credit A1. Colleagues Boutique, they do custom shirts, and I'll be reaching out to them soon because I have a great idea for a custom shirt that I'm, work I'm working on. For the Chantel X, he hires truck drivers and they also specialize in refrigeration and shipping. Thank you, Brother Chantel. Brother Jabbar Muhammad of Chicago, Client First Construction Incorporated, painting, carpentry, flooring, plumbing, et cetera. If you're in the Chicago area or in the Memphis area, reach out to Brother Jabbar Muhammad. His number is right there. Um, Dr. Henry M. Carter, King Henry's Turkey Leg, right here in Atlanta, Georgia. So if you're in the Atlanta area, make sure you get some turkey legs from Dr. Carter. Brother Rashad Muhammad in Chicago, COVID-19 disinfecting cleaning services. Make sure you uh, reach out to Brother Rashad if you want something clean in Chicago. My father's book, A Soldier in the Movement of Christ, abdulsharif.com. Thank you very, very much. And last but not least, my two books, Cleopatra, which is a children's book, and No Father, No Excuse. If you would like to make a donation to the People's Podcast, please cash at the People's Podcast. Boom. This is the captain. I'm right back with you. Oh, that's wonderful. I need a list of all those things. <laughs> Praise to I guess, well. And what I wanted to ask you is, speaking of your children, uh, what advice would you give to future mothers? Um, love your children. Now, I don't know if this is going to be popular, but love your children more than yourself, which hmm. means you're not going to always get it right but be willing to sacrifice for your children. Now, that doesn't mean give up your life's mission or purpose or dreams because you just have to work harder. So when you start having children, you're taking on that your life's journey is still going, but you have got to make sure theirs is moving forward also. Um, and when I say love them more than yourself, I, I, I I may not be saying that correctly or getting it across. I'm really not meaning just throw yourself away. But there are a lot of parents that are not willing to sacrifice for their children. They're not um, quite understanding that you kind of had a choice of being a parent or not, meaning you could have waited and finished up whatever you wanted to do. But when you took on to be a parent, sometimes you're going to have to sacrifice your sleep. Sometimes your dream is going to be delayed. It may not be canceled, but it may be delayed because you took on that greater job of parenting, of making a way through the world for them. So that would, that would be what I think of. Beautiful. And what advice would you give to future wives? Um, be willing <laughs> to compromise, but also be willing to be strong enough 
to stick up for yourself. There is a, um, a point where you're going to be disappointed. You're going to be, uh, you're going to have to have some give and take, but you also don't do yourself or your spouse any, um, you, you do them a disservice if you never speak up for yourself. You just kind of internalize it and become resentful. I don't mean argue with them, but stand up for yourself. If you honestly believe something, you honestly want to do something, you owe it to your spouse to tell them that. You owe it to them to give them a chance to help you be what you want to be. Because otherwise, you're going to sit there and you're going to say, well, look, they held me back from this and they held me back from that. Mm -hmm. one, of, one of the biggest things that I wanted to do was get my degree. And I, between marriage and children, it got pushed off to the side. When I married my husband, Brother Kelvin, one of the biggest things he kept saying is, you know what? You keep saying you want this degree. You need to go do it. You know, and I and I give him an excuse. Well, you know, I have the children, I have work, I have this. And he said, well, I don't want to hear that. If you want to do it, then you need to go do it. OK, because I'm going to make sure that if that was the education you wanted, that you're going to get it. If you wanted the degree, I'm going to make sure you do it. And I had to uh, give him the chance. And here he was. He wanted to, to do this, but he would have never had the chance if I didn't speak up and say it. Beautiful, excellent advice, wonderful. And what advice would you give to future um, laborers, but people who specifically want to be like captains in the military? What advice would you give them? First of all, don't want it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, allow it to come to you, but I wouldn't pursue it. I would tell them if if you see yourself in a leadership role, if that's what you want, that's great. Because we want people who want to serve. But for them, I would tell them, make sure you understand that being a laborer is a servant. The minister told us that if we weren't servants to the people, then we weren't laborers. A laborer is not just, you know, the person that gets to be in charge. It's the person willing to serve the people, the MGT, the FOI, the most. The one who is willing to lay it all out there and give and give, as the minister said, take plenty. If you're not wanting to do that, then really look for something else that you want to do because a, a laborer is a servant. Beautiful. What, what was your fondest memory of being a Vanguard? Oh my gosh. My fondest memory is every everything that we did together. When I came through Vanguard, first off, it was a choice. You chose whether or not to go the path to being Vanguard and you worked hard for it. We had class before MGT class, then we had MGT class, then we had class afterwards. And even though that was hard work, my fondest memories was standing on post for hours and hours and hours with my sisters, us eating breakfast together, us praying together. The fondest memory of Vanguard was the togetherness. That was a, that is a sisterhood. That was your sister. You are linked together and we are linked together for life. I'm just telling you, Vanguard, it, 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 it becomes kind of like um, an emotional attachment that you're not going to break. When Mother Tynetta talked about us being strong enough that we would be able to read each other's thoughts and tell each other when there's danger and things like that, that was for real. That is for real. Okay, that is the level of sisterhood we will get to, and we have gotten to. You can feel when your sister needs something. You can look over and be like, oh, that sister needs a hug. That sister needs something, and that's Vanguard. 
Beautiful, beautiful. And what do you do for fun, ma'am? Right now, I walk around. Um, okay, I harass my husband. That's my fun. I'm just going to tell you. We are out here now. In the, <laughs> we are out here in the country, and we can sit. I can walk out on my on, on my porch, and there is nothing but trees, grass, and 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 us. And so, one of the biggest things that I I do for fun is to harass him, make him hold my hand when we walk around out outside in the mm, grass mm, mm, and, mm. and walk down to the ponds and things like that. I honestly wish I could see my grandchildren more. Um, I've been telling them we got enough land, they need to just move and we make our own little you know, community right here, but they're not ready for the country yet. But uh, for fun, I relax. I'm just telling you, I, I sit and I'll read. I, you know, like I said, harass my husband, and I enjoy the peace and quiet of being here. Praise be to Allah. Yes, and I hope you, that, that is your dream. Uh, of course, my mother had a vision that was very similar to that. I tell my siblings all the time, she always wanted us to live very, very close to each other. If it was her dream, probably be in the same house, but I'm trying to get us at least be on the same street, at least be on the same 10 minutes away. But yeah, we're working on it. Um, exactly. So I hope you, yeah, hope your children take you up on that offer. Um, what is your favorite musical album of all time? Mm, a musical album. Les Mis Robin. Okay, 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 okay. So you like shows too? I mean, like musicals. Okay, okay. I, I'm just going to tell you that, and don't laugh when I say it, but Jesus Christ Superstar. Okay, 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 Les, okay, okay. Les Mis will make me cry every time I see it. And every time I see it or hear it, I think of another little nuance to it. And I can relate so much to the struggle it talks about in there. And Jesus Christ Superstar, that was just one of the first ones. I memorized every word of that album. I could sing it to the to the mirror with my hairbrush, the whole entire thing. Beautiful. Mind you, okay. when everybody was asleep. Excellent. See, I didn't I didn't I never knew that. And when I I didn't mean to say musical like a musical, but like what's your favorite album of all time? Oh, my favorite album. I would have to say. Maybe Janet Jackson. I, I mean, I don't know. No, let me take that back. My favorite, my favorite album was Tina. Tina Turner. I can sing. Okay. She can dance. She's a strong woman. Any album by Tina Turner would be my favorite. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay. And uh, yeah, I like Tina Turner. I, love, I think I'm, I know her music because of what's love had to do with it. But shout out to Tina Turner's uh, albums. Um, oh my gosh, you need to know so much more than that. Tina Turner <laughs> sang a um, Sam Cooke song that will make you cry. Mm, mm, mm. I, I, I YouTube it. Yep. I YouTube it. I never knew that. I, I'm a fan of Sam Cooke for sure, but I never knew Tina Turner sang his song. I know yep. that. Will you ever write a book on your personal life? I would. I don't know um, if I would write it because I like to write. I, I have always liked to write it. And growing up, I liked journals and I liked to write and I used to write short stories. I would write a book. Okay, I don't okay. know that anybody would find it, you know, interesting because I know some of my thoughts are corny and they're a little old fashioned, but um, definitely. Because if, if anything, I, I'm gonna tell you this, any, if anything that I've gone through, good or bad, I could pass on and it would help somebody then I would do it. You know, that's just me. But what there has would be, to be the a reason thing? that we suffer? Yes, ma'am. What would be one, if you can give us one thing that you would like to pass on, what would that be? Um, one thing I would pass on is don't be too headstrong. A lot of people tried to tell me certain things as I was growing, growing along. And especially in those years in my 
late teens, 20, you know, 25, you couldn't tell me anything. Whatever I thought of, that was the right thing. And mm -hmm. if I could pass on anything, I would tell people, okay, what you thinking might be right, but at least hear what somebody says, try and, and see if it blends in or if you can use or extract any of it. And then go with what you think you should do. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And I have one last question. And thank you all for your comments. Danielle said, uh, make sure I get to Danielle. Um, Arianne said, that's all our mothers have. All our mothers uh -uh. have their dream. Danielle uh -uh. says, facts, that's too, with a whole bunch of O's, country for her um, to live out there. I'm assuming, Danielle, go out there. <laughs> My goodness. But uh, what, what would you like your um, legacy to be, ma'am? Um, I would like my legacy to be for somebody to say that that sister helped build this nation in whatever small little amount, whatever little bit, I would love for my legacy to at least be where somebody is able to even if they don't remember my name, I don't even care if they remember my name. If something that I have done or sacrificed can, can be like one of the little keystones of what built a future for my, for, for my family or for my, my loved ones. Um, because I honestly and truly, I, I'm, I'm joyful. But I would love to be able to be one of the ones that helps move forward, move things forward. Mm -hmm. Praise be to Allah. And will you ever go into? Can I say one? Can I say one thing? Yes, ma'am. When I say that, I'm not trying to be um, thinking of myself as oh, I just want to be remembered. I want us to remember one thing. We are all here at the same time for a specific reason. Those apostles around Jesus were around Jesus at that time for a reason. Yes, and I honestly believe that the Jesus that is in our midst, we are here for a reason. There's a reason I wasn't born 20 years ahead or 20 years behind. There's a reason why I was here at this time around this set of people and this man, and it has to be because we're meant to move along, move along with them. Beautiful, praise be to a lot. What actually follows perfectly into my la my last question. I want to ask you: Would you ever go into the ministry, and would you ever get back into a uh, position to teach the the young sisters again? It all depends if someone needs me. Um, I don't turn down any type of help for someone. Um, I think everyone that knows me knows that I kind of had that I want to preach kind of mentality just because I feel like we should always use whatever knowledge we have. And if we, if I read something in a book tomorrow, the next day I should be sharing with someone. I, mm -hmm. I I don't feel that we have the right to hold on to things that we could be sharing that can help someone. Um, so I would always be willing to help and I would always be willing, you know, to talk to people or things like that. And, um, so yes, I would. Praise be to Allah. Well, all you young sisters who are out there who are going through stuff and need anything, reach out to Sister Amy Muhammad on Facebook, inbox her so she can, <laughs> so she can help assist you with, with, her, with, her, with you all's problems. Well, I, well I wanna... thank you very much. You know, I was very nervous about running my mouth on here. Um, and I, I kind of, I kept putting it off and, and putting it off. And I, I even told my daughter, you know, nobody's going to want to hear anything I have to say. But like I said, I feel like I love my sisters and brothers. And I mean, there is nothing that is too good to give them. Um, and if there's anything that I've gone through that I can give, even if it's just, you know, a, a, a 
a minute where they're not having to watch the news, then I give it. I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't deny any of that. And I am so thankful. I have been blessed to be around such wonderful, wonderful people. There is nothing that just comes from me that is, is, is just great. Everything, if anybody finds anything interesting or, oh, that sounded like a good idea, then that came from the people that I've been around who have helped me and, and you know, helped me to grow and just pointed me in the right direction or just showed me some love. There's nothing that comes from just Sister Amy. This is all from those around me. And guess what? Those around me came from a lot. God put each one of us around each other for each other. So it goes right back to a lot. And so we can't be any more thankful than to use whatever he gives us. All praise due to a lot. Sister, okay, Sierra Robinson says, and you've accomplished, and you've accomplished just that. Uh, Naima Muhammad uh, says, thank you. And my sister Miriam says, your story matters. Thank you so much for sharing. You are a treasure to our nation and that you truly are. I want to thank you again, Sister Captain, for taking time out of your busy schedule to come give us some information as well as some inspiration. Everybody, please like, share, and subscribe once we put it on YouTube today. Um, I love you and your family. And I just uh, thank you for always being um, that. I think yeah. I think your daughters were being nice. You were you were real hard on me, always trying to like whip me and be strict and stuff. But I appreciate I appreciate the discipline uh, from you, Sister Amy. <laughs> Listen, I was hard on them, and Sierra is my niece. That's like my my fifth, that's my fifth daughter. She knows I have tapped her little butt too. So anytime I I, I issue some some correction, it's only because I love them so much that I want them to to run towards their success. Beautiful. Praise be to God. And you've done a great job at that. Thank you all Praise for watching the people's God. podcast. And it really means a lot to me, ma'am. Oh, me right, too. So I appreciate you so much. So much. Thank you. Thank you, guys, so much.